हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर अद्वैत एंड वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर एट फॉर सेल द यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ बिफोर वी बिगिन टूडेज लेक्चर लेट्स हैव अ क्विक रिकैप ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव डन इन द प्रीवियस सेवन लेक्चर्स सो आर जर्नी अबाउट सेल द यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ बिगैन विद लेक्चर नंबर वन वेन वी स्पोक अबाउट द इंट्रोडक्शन टू सेल एंड वॉट एग्जैक्टली इज अ सेल इन लेक्चर नंबर टू आई स्पोक अबाउट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ माइक्रोस्कोपी and the cell theory in lecture number 3 we spoke about what are the parts of a cell what are the basics of genetics and what are the characteristics of a cell in lecture number 4 we spoke about the nucleus in lecture number 5 i spoke about plastids in lecture number 6 we spoke about mitochondria and in lecture number 7 which was the last lecture we spoke about ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum it will not be possible for me to revise everything that we have done in all these seven lectures that you can see here so as far as today's lecture is concerned i am quickly going to go through everything that we have done in the last lecture which was about ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum right so we saw that as far as a eukaryotic cell is concerned it is going to have the living material called as protoplasm and in some eukaryotic cells there may be a non living cell wall which is protecting it all living cells irrespective of cell wall will always have protoplasm so the protoplasm is further classified the protoplasm is further classified into the nucleus which is the controlling center of the cell the cytoplasm which is going to be the executive center and the plasma membrane which holds all of this together the nucleus contains the genetic material in the form of dna and rna that is responsible for transmission of hereditary characters we have seen this when we were talking about the nucleus then we started off with the cell organelles and as far as the cell organelles are concerned we have finished chloroplast or plastids we have finished mitochondria we have finished everything related to ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum and those last two organelles ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum is what i am going to revise now correct okay so like i said plastids is done mitochondria is done now let's quickly also revise ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum that is what we have done in the last lecture so last lecture began with what are nucleic acids acids found in the nucleus are called nucleic acids and these nucleic acids or nucleic acids are going to be of two main types either dna or rna both of them are nucleic acids dna stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and rna stands for ribonucleic acid the difference being in the sugar contained in the nucleic acid dna has deoxyribose sugar and rna has ribose sugar we also saw that rna is going to be of further three types which are mrna trna and rrna for our discussion the only important thing was rrna which is also called ribosomal rna moving on we saw these new latin words vesicles are going to be called as sacs you have cisterna which means flattened sacs tubules which means small pipes or small tubes and we saw that reticulum means nothing but a network anything which is going to be repeated is going to be called as a reticulum so after this we moved on to what is cell fractionation so i explained to you that cell fractionation is the process used to separate cellular components while preserving individual functions of each of the parts cell fractionation is done so that individual parts of a cell can be isolated and studied so that we can know better about their biochemistry and function cell fractionation is based on the process of centrifugal force so this is something i explained in detail in the last lecture that cell fractionation is based on centrifugal force how do we do cell fractionation we first take a tissue sample and put it into a blender to get something called as the homogenate the process by which we do this by which we break down all the membranes and ensure that we get a homogeneous mass in the form of homogenate is going to be called as homogenization now after you get the homogenate it is put into a machine which can apply the centrifugal force that machine is simply called as a centrifuge machine and this centrifuge machine is nothing but a test tube holder which has been mounted to a motor so you start applying the centrifugal force because of the application of the centrifugal force the particles which are inside the homogenate depending on their density depending on their mass depending on their shape structure 
they will begin to separate because of the centrifugal force which has been applied. So once you do that, this is what you will get. You will get a pellet and you will get a supernatant. This process is called centrifugation. Centrifugation is based on the principle that particles will be separated once you spin them and you apply centrifugal force. Larger particles will settle to the bottom and lighter ones will be at the top. So this is how the diagram looks like. You have various, various sized and various densities of particles which are floating in the homogenate and when you apply a low spin only the heaviest are going to separate but when you apply a high spin even the ones which are not heavy will also get separated over time and if you take this supernatant and if you apply even more centrifugal force for a longer period of time even these green particles which here appear to be very small and light even they will separate from the supernatant. So by varying the speed and duration various cell components can be separated from one another. How exactly do you apply this varying forces? So to apply more centrifugal force you would need to go faster which will require a better motor which will be seen in the case of an ultra centrifuge. This ultra centrifuge was devised by this man whose name was Theodor Swedberg and he was a Swedish chemist who got a Nobel Prize in 1926 for his invention of the ultra centrifuge. This is the ultra centrifuge that he designed and right here, right here, right here you can see that this is how it appears that is where you put the test tubes and this machine can rotate at up to 1,30,000 revolutions or rotations per minute. It can apply a force of 1 million times that of the gravitational pull. So very very high level of force or centrifugal force can be applied in an ultra centrifuge. Now Swedberg is also responsible for something called as the Swedberg units which we have discussed in detail in the last lecture. Swedberg unit measures how fast a particle of a given size and shape settles to the bottom of a solution. In short Swedberg units measure the rate at which a particle will settle down in a solution. It is also called as the sedimentation coefficient and it is denoted by the alphabet S. Swedberg units are going to be determined by a particle's mass, density and shape. At the same time if a particle is heavier with more compact shape its Swedberg value will be greater than if the particle was lighter and with a less compact shape. So think of it like this that if you were to have a cotton wool ball which was fluffy and if you were to just squish it and get this kind of a ball the mass would remain the same but this ball would have more density and hence it would have a higher S value as compared to this one. Clear? Does everybody remember this from the last lecture? Okay, moving on. So now let's quickly once again recap how tissue or cell fractionation is carried out. You will take the tissue sample or you will take your cell sample, you will put it through a blender, all the membranes will disintegrate and everything from the cell will literally spill out and you will get something which is going to be called as the homogenate. This process is called homogenization and following that we will take the homogenate and we will apply centrifugal force to it using a centrifuge machine or an ultra centrifuge. Post that what we get is the homogenate having separated into a pellet and into something called as the supernatant. This process is called as centrifugation. We can do something called as differential centrifugation by which we can separate out all the various things which are there in the tissue homogenate. By using more rotations per minute for a longer duration even the smallest particles in the supernatant or the homogenate can be separated from the rest. So this entire thing was called as the process of cell fractionation and why we need to do it and how the whole process is carried out. From here we came to the first cell organelles which were ribosomes. So as far as ribosomes are concerned they are basically little protein factories which are going to make proteins inside a cell. These ribosomes were first seen by this person George Plate and ribosomes are the granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Plate in 1953. He saw that the ribosomes which we know look like this today 
as composed of ribonucleic acids. To be extremely precise, it is going to be the ribosomal RNA which is going to make the ribosomes. At the same time, they are not surrounded by any membrane. So, nucleolus does not have a membrane, nucleus has a double membrane, chloroplast has a double membrane, mitochondria has a double membrane, ribosomes just like the nucleolus have no membrane. They are not membrane bound organelles. These ribosomes are going to have two subunits, a larger subunit which you can see above in blue and a smaller subunit which you can see below in purple. In the case of a eukaryotic ribosome, the larger subunit is going to be 60S, the smaller subunit is going to be 40S. They combine together to form something which is not 100S. This eukaryotic ribosome is not 100S but it is going to be 80S. So, eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S. Then we saw that this is the larger subunit of a prokaryotic ribosome. It is going to be 50S. The smaller subunit is going to be 30S. Together, here in the case of a prokaryotic ribosome, they do not form 80S, they form 70S. So, eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S, prokaryotic ribosomes are 70S. Then we saw what was NCRT's text or NCRT's opinion about ribosomes. Ribosomes are the granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Plade in 1953. They are composed of ribonucleic acid, more accurately it is ribosomal RNA and proteins and are not surrounded by any membrane. The eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S whereas the prokaryotic ribosomes are 70S. Each ribosome has two subunits, larger and smaller. The two subunits of 80S are 60S and 40S and that of the 70S are 50S and 30S. 60 and 40 does not equal to 100, it equals to 80 and 50 and 30 does not equal to 80, it equals to 70. Here the S Swedberg units stands for sedimentation coefficient and it is indirectly a measure of density and size. Please understand by judging how fast the rate at which something will settle down in a solution we indirectly come to know about its density. So, Swedberg units do not directly measure density but indirectly they help us to measure the density and size. Finally, both 70 and 80s ribosomes are composed of two subunits as we just saw about a minute ago. Clear? So, that finishes everything about ribosomes that we had discussed in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we also spoke about endoplasmic reticulum. So, as far as endoplasmic reticulum is concerned, it is the extensive reticulum which is present inside the cell. So, I showed you that here we have a plant cell and an animal cell. In the case of a plant cell, whatever you see here is the endoplasmic reticulum. In the case of an animal cell, whatever you see here is the endoplasmic reticulum. So, we enlarge this, we took a animal cell, we highlighted the endoplasmic reticulum and we saw it in this magnified illustration. So, the first thing you see here are these structures which have been pointed out right now which are the double membranes of the nuclear envelope. Continuous with the double membrane of the nuclear envelope are various cisternae, flattened sacs. You also have these tiny little vesicles which are leaving from the cisternae and you are going to have these structures here called as tubules. So, this extensive reticulum within the cytoplasm formed of cisternae, vesicles and tubules is called as the endoplasmic reticulum. So, endoplasmic reticulum is extensive and it is continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus. The cisternae, vesicle and tubules all are going to comprise of a cavity which is called as a lumen which you can see everywhere here and because of this the entire cytoplasm can be divided into two compartments. Whatever is bound by the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum can be called as the luminal compartment and whatever is outside can be called as extra luminal or it can be called as cyto, cytoplasmic compartment. So, we have the luminal compartment and the extra luminal or the cytoplasmic compartment. Also, these golden yellow structures which you see sticking to the endoplasmic reticulum, sticking to the cisternae of the endoplasmic reticulum are called as the ribosomes. So, if these are going to be the ribosomes, this endoplasmic reticulum in the microscope will appear rough. 
and can be called as rough endoplasmic reticulum. At the same time, you will notice that this cisterne does not have any kind of ribosomes. So when you see this under the microscope, it appears to be smooth and it is called as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So endoplasmic reticulum, which can be denoted by ER, is of two types, either with ribosomes or without ribosomes. Either with ribosomes or without ribosomes. If it is with ribosomes, it will appear rough. If it is without ribosomes, it will appear smooth. This will be called as rough endoplasmic reticulum. This will be called as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Of course, rough endoplasmic reticulum is associated with the ribosomes, the protein factories. So ribosomes, when they make their protein chains or the protein, they will simply put it inside the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So rough endoplasmic reticulum deals with storing proteins, whereas smooth endoplasmic reticulum will deal with storing all the various lipids. So how does it look under the electron microscope? This is the illustration that we've been studying and this is how it appears under the electron microscope. Here you have the lumen of the cisternae and all these structures, all these structures which you see here are nothing but the ribosomes. So this here is rough endoplasmic reticulum and on this side you can see that there are lots of vesicles but there are no associated ribosomes. So this part here can be called as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So dear students, what does NCRT say about endoplasmic reticulum? Electron microscope studies of eukaryotic cells reveal the presence of a network or reticulum of tiny tubular structures scattered in the cytoplasm that is called endoplasmic reticulum can be shortened in the form of ER, endoplasmic reticulum. They are extensive and continuous with the outer membranes of the nucleus. Hence, endoplasmic reticulum divides the intracellular space into two distinct compartments, luminal and extraluminal. So luminal is inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, extraluminal is the cytoplasm compartment. The endoplasmic reticulum often shows ribosomes attached to their outer surface. The endoplasmic reticulum bearing ribosomes on their surface is called rough endoplasmic reticulum. The one which does not have any ribosomes will appear smooth and is called as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum is frequently observed in cells which are actively producing proteins whereas smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the major site for synthesis of lipids. And that dear students finishes the revision for the last lecture where we spoke about the ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum. So as you can see here we have finished plastids, we have finished mitochondria, ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum. So now today we have to continue with the remaining cell organelles. So dear students, today's lecture starts now. The first thing that we have to see today are a few more Latin words. The first one is the prefix cis, C-I-S. Usually cis is used in front of a word. So we say that words can be prefixed with this three alphabets, C-I-S. Cis means on the same side of or nearer. So if something is on the same side or is near to something, we can use the prefix cis. For example, earlier they used to use words like cis Atlantic. Now cis Atlantic basically means on this side of the Atlantic Ocean closer to Europe. At the same time, there is another word, another prefix which is trans. Now the word trans means across or beyond. So even today we use words like transatlantic. So transatlantic basically means through the Atlantic Ocean on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So cis means on one side or nearer to something and trans means away from or on the other side of something. Is that clear? Cis, trans. Next, we have this word which is a suffix. A prefix is what you add at the beginning of a word and a suffix is usually something that you add at the end of a word. So the suffix that I want you to know for today is osis. The word osis means process. So whenever we add a suffix called as osis to a word, it means process. The next word is phagos, which means to eat or to devour. Now, I know that in the first lecture itself, I had told you of a word called as trophos, which also means to eat. 
but the final nuance here is that trophos means to eat and nourish yourself whereas the word phagos means to eat or to devour basically means to just engulf pura ka pura kha jao so trophos means khao shanti se khao eat it let the thing nourish your body whereas the word phagos means to devour or simply eat something very rapidly so that's the difference here between phagos and trophos the next word we have to do today is lysis which i think that you must have done in school which means to break and the last word for today is soma which means body so the last word for today is soma which means body so i hope that these seven words which you see on your screen right now which you see on your screen right now are absolutely clear to everybody okay so now let's start with our first organelle for today which was observed by this man whose name was camillo golgi now he was an italian physician living in the later half of the 19th century and earlier part of the 20th century golgi was the first one to observe these dark staining parts or dense areas next to the nucleus so he was the first one who observed that there are densely stained reticular structures near the nucleus this was in the year 1898 in his memory we call these dark staining reticular structures as golgi bodies so the first organelle that we have to do today is golgi bodies now here if we were to take the animal cell and if i was to take this area showing the golgi body and if i was to just take this area and if i was to magnify it this is how the golgi bodies would appear like now in this diagram itself you can clearly say that golgi bodies are also made up of the flattened sac like structures which are going to be called as cisternae so even golgi bodies are made up of cisternae you can see that golgi bodies have cisternae which are connected to each other via these little tubules and they also have these sac like structures which can be called as vesicles so just like the endoplasmic reticulum i want you to remember that golgi bodies also are composed of cisternae vesicles and tubules mostly cisternae so very much like the endoplasmic reticulum so how are they different the first main difference between golgi body and endoplasmic reticulum is that endoplasmic reticulum as we saw in yesterday's lecture in the previous lecture and we also revised right now endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the outer nuclear membrane the golgi bodies are not the golgi bodies have no continuation they are not attached to either the plasma membrane or the nuclear membrane so that is the first main difference between a golgi body and the endoplasmic reticulum even though both of them comprise of cisternae the other main difference is going to be their function which we will come to subsequently right okay so if we were to take the cell and as always i have highlighted the part which is the golgi body and let's see an illustration for the same so what you see here are the cisternae of the golgi body so golgi body have various number of cisternae which are present within it which are making up the golgi body or the golgi complex now these are the cisternae which are stacked parallel to each other so i want you to know that cisternae are basically flattened sac like structures in this case they can also be flattened disc like structures so instead of having a flattened sac it will be a flattened disc now if it's a disc please remember that it will have a center and all these discs are going to have their centers almost aligned so we can say that this structure is literally concentric discs or cisternae which are stacked one on top of the other so here of course is a cut section that you can see here right it's discs which have been stacked and which have been cut and that is what you see so they are stacked parallel to each other and they have a diameter of about 0.5 to 1 micron so if you were to go from this area to this area the diameter of this particular cisternae or flattened disc is about 0.5 to 1 micron also like i mentioned previously all of the cisternae which are going to be in the form of flattened discs 
are going to be concentrically arranged near the nucleus. They will be concentrically arranged near the nucleus. So all of them are stacked in such a way that their centers are going to align, which in geometry you have learned is called as concentricity. So all these cisternae are concentrically arranged near the nucleus and they are going to have a distinct convex side facing the nucleus. So think of it like this. This here is the nucleus. Nucleus is a spherical structure as we have done before. Somewhere here is the Golgi body. The first cisternae is going to be like this. It will be convex. It will be convex. And as you go from this cisternae to this cisternae to this cisternae to this cisternae to this cisternae, it will become concave. So if you take the whole Golgi complex, the side which is facing the nucleus is very clearly convex. And from convex, 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 you will go to straight, 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 straight and becoming concave. So the side facing the nucleus is a distinct convex side, whereas the side away from the nucleus is going to be distinctly concave. So there is a distinct convex side facing the nucleus and there is a distinct concave side which is away from the nucleus. The distinct convex side facing the nucleus can also be called as the cis face or the forming face. You will understand in a few minutes why it is called as the forming face. But I think you can understand why it is called as the cis face. Cis as the prefix. So why is it called as the cis face? Because it is the face, it is the face which is on the same side as that of the nucleus. So I think everybody has now understood where this is going. If this is the cis face, then the concave cisternae which are on this side, on the other side, beyond on this side of the nucleus, what will they be called? Correct, they will be called as the trans face. So the trans phase is also called as the maturing phase. So there is going to be a cis phase or a forming phase and there is going to be a trans phase or a maturing phase. Both of them are clearly separate. There is one on the same side as the nucleus and the other one, the trans phase, which is on the opposite side. Both of them are going to be independent, but they are connected to each other. So even though they are entirely different, they are connected via the various tubules and the vesicles. So before I proceed on to the next diagram, I want you to remember that the side closer to the nucleus, the cisternae are called as the cis face or the forming face. The side on this side, the cisternae on this side are called as the trans face or the maturing face. And even though they are completely different, they are connected to each other via the cisternae in between or the tubules which are in between all these various cisternae. So why is it called cis, trans, forming, maturing? All of those questions will be answered now. So have a look at the next illustration. Now this is a cut section of a part of the cell where you can see that this is the nucleus. All this yellow area here is the cytoplasm and outside here you have the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Also surrounding the nuclei you can see the various cisternae tubules and vesicles which are attached to the nucleus which will be called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it has the ribosomes. So this is what you already know from your previous knowledge from what we have done in the last lecture. Now today I am also showing you this which is the Golgi complex. So now you can see that these are the cisternae vesicles and tubules of the Golgi complex. All of them are concentrically stacked or arranged with respect to the nucleus. We can also see that this is going to be the cis phase and this is going to be the trans phase. Now notice what is happening here. The ribosomes are the protein factories which have made some proteins but those proteins will not work in the cell unless they are processed they require further processing. So proteins from the ribosomes cannot be directly used. They need to be processed so that various activities of the cells can be carried out. Those proteins can be used to make the membranes. Those proteins can be used to make organelles. Those proteins will be used to make various enzymes. But the proteins which are made by the ribosomes are absolutely raw. They need processing. Who is going to do all this processing? Correct, the Golgi apparatus. That is the main function of Golgi apparatus. 
it is the part of the cell which does all the processing required to change things from one thing to another or to do various catabolic and anabolic activities by which one compound can be polished and made into another compound. So all that work is done by the Golgi complex. So look what happens here. In the diagram, you can see that there is this structure here, which is a transport vesicle from the endoplasmic reticulum. So what has happened is that the ribosomes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum have made some proteins and those proteins have been put into the lumen. Those proteins have been put into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, the cisternae of the endoplasmic reticulum. From here, these proteins have been pinched off into this vesicle and this vesicle is now approaching the Golgi complex. Can you see that? Right. Which part of the Golgi complex is it approaching from? Correct. It is approaching towards the cis phase. Have you now understood why it is called as a cis phase? Because it is going to be towards the nucleus on the same side. Hence, it is called as cis. Now, you can see that this transport vesicle, this transport vesicle, which contains the proteins, the raw proteins which need processing, and it comes here and fuses with the cisternae of the cis phase. Now, from here, these proteins will be pushed on to this lumen where they will be processed and pushed on to this cisternae, to this cisternae, to this cisternae, to this cisternae, till they go from the cis phase right up to the trans phase. So they will pass through and they will reach the trans phase. Now once they reach from the cis to the trans, once these proteins, the raw proteins which needed processing, once they reach from the cis phase to the trans phase, their transformation is complete. They have been converted to the final product which can be used by the cell. So you will see this vesicle leaving the trans phase and this vesicle is now being put into the cytoplasm which is going to contain the modified proteins or the modified material which can now be used by the cell. If you have now understood this process, if you have now understood this process, it should be clear to you why the cis phase is called as the forming phase and the trans phase is called as the maturing phase. The reason for that being cis phase is going to take the vesicle, the transport vesicle and it is going to start forming the final product. As the proteins and the material pass through the various cisternae from the cis phase to the trans phase, it will be transformed and once it gets transformed, it will be put into a vesicle which will leave from the trans phase. Since this is the place from where the mature vesicle will leave, the trans phase is also called as the maturing phase. So now, is everybody clear as to why this is called as the cis phase or the forming phase and this one will be called as the trans phase or it can also be called as the maturation phase. So we have this tiny little vesicle here which contains the modified final proteins which can be now used by the cell. But while this entire transformation is happening, when the proteins are going from the forming phase, cis phase to the trans phase or the maturing phase, a lot of byproducts or waste products may also be produced which you can see here. So there is another vesicle coming out from the trans phase which can be the waste products. Now these waste products need to be thrown out and they get thrown out as you can see here, as you can see here, they get thrown out, as you can see here, they get thrown out by a process called exocytosis, exocytosis. So now what's exocytosis? Large particles or material moving through the cell membrane can move in two directions, either it will be inward or it will be outward. So you may have a membrane. So this is the inside part of the cell and this is the outside part of a cell. So either material will move from outside to inside by passing through the cell membrane or it will move from inside to outside by passing through the cell membrane. So materials passing through a cell will either be inwards or they will be outwards. Now, if they move inwards, it is called as endocytosis and if they move outwards, it is called as exocytosis. Now why endocytosis or exocytosis? Endo means inside, 
exo means outside cyto means cell and osis means process endo cyto osis process by which cell ke andar kuch aata hai exo cyto osis exo cytosis osis process cyto cell exo bahar process by which cell ke bahar so the process by which things move inwards into the cell is called endocytosis and the process by which things move outward will be called as exocytosis so let's quickly have a look at endocytosis and exocytosis and how it performs so please have a look at the diagram given here now here you can see that there is an extracellular space there is plasma membrane and there is the intracellular space the space inside the cell so here you now notice that there is a tiny vesicle with some material that needs to be thrown out notice how the vesicle moves from inside the cell and it contains the blue kachra that it has it moves 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 fuses with the cell membrane and literally pushes its kachra outside so this little animation that you see here is going to be called as exocytosis are we clear with what is exocytosis now those of you who are fully alert will realize that the exact ulta process is this one can you see this is exactly the opposite of what we saw before so now instead of a cell throwing something out if there is some material on the outside the cell is trying to take it on the inside so this process by which a cell is going to take something inside will be called as endocytosis now whatever a cell will take inside will either be some solid particle or it will be some liquid particle so if the cell is going to actually take some solid particles inside like how you see here it will mean that the cell is eating something devouring something engulfing something which is the greek or the latin word for that correct it is phagos so this kind of endocytosis if it is for a solid will be called phagocytosis at the same time it could also be a liquid if it is a liquid it is as if the cell is drinking something so it will be called pinocytosis phago meaning to devour or to eat and pino basically means to drink so endocytosis can be broadly classified into two inward movement within a cell can be broadly classified into two either the things moving inside will be solid or they will be liquid if they are solid it will be called phagocytosis and if they are liquid it will be called pinocytosis so have a look at this chart and after having studied this now it should be clear to you that materials moving through the cell membrane can be doing that either inwards or outwards if it is moving inwards it will be called endocytosis if it is moving outwards it will be called as exocytosis endocytosis can either be liquid or solid if it is solid it is called phagocytosis if it is liquid it will be called as pinocytosis so i hope that this chart is now clear to you so why did we do this chart right now as to what is endocytosis exocytosis phagocytosis pinocytosis so that this particular thing is clear to everybody this particular thing that the waste which is produced in this vesicle will be thrown out via exocytosis is that clear so dear students i hope this cell organelle is now clear to all of you this is a golgi complex or a golgi body it is comprising of the same kind of cisternary vesicles and tubules like the endoplasmic reticulum however like the endoplasmic reticulum it is not connected to any membrane the endoplasmic reticulum is connected to the outer nuclear membrane this is not connected to any membrane its cisternae are going to be disc shaped and are going to be concentrically arranged with the nucleus they are going to be about 0.5 to 1 microns in diameter the side which is facing the nucleus the cisternae facing the nucleus are convex and are called as the cis face or the forming face the side opposite to that is going to be called as the trans face or it can also be called as the maturing face the main function of the golgi complex is to process the material that enters the cis face usually the proteins which come from the endoplasmic reticulum 
and that is why this whole structure is so close to the endoplasmic reticulum. So all the vesicles which need some sort of processing will move towards the cis phase and from the cis phase by passing through all the cisternae in between they will reach the trans phase and the trans phase is where vesicles will leave and those vesicles will have either waste products or they will have the material that the cell can use. The waste product is thrown out of the cell by using a process called as exocytosis. Also dear students, the Golgi apparatus is the important site where you will form glycoproteins and glycolipids. So whatever lipids or proteins may enter inside, some carbohydrate groups can be added to it to form glycoproteins or glycolipids. So how does this look under the electron microscope, this illustration that we have been studying. So this is how it looks in the compound microscope. You can see that this is the convex side which faces the nucleus and these are all the incoming vesicles towards the cis side and here you have the vesicles which are leaving through the trans phase or through the maturing phase. So this is how it looks in the electron microscope. This is how it looks in the electron microscope. What does NCRT say about Golgi bodies? Camilo Golgi in 1898 first observed densely stained reticular structures near the nucleus. These were later named Golgi bodies after him. Varied number of cisternae are present in a Golgi complex. So the number may vary. There can be anywhere from 5 to 6 to about even up to 40. The Golgi complex consists of many flat disc shaped sacs or cisternae of around 0.5 to 1 micron in diameter. These are stacked parallel to each other and they are concentrically arranged near the nucleus with a distinct convex cis side or the forming phase and the concave trans or the maturing phase. The cis and the trans phase of the organelle are entirely different but they are interconnected. Golgi bodies are also principally performing the function of packaging material. Their main function is to package material to be delivered either to intracellular targets to be used within the cell or to be secreted outside the cell or to be thrown outside the cell. Materials to be packaged in the form of vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum fuse on the cis phase of the Golgi apparatus and then slowly slowly moves towards the uh, trans phase which can also be called as the maturing phase. This explains why the Golgi apparatus remains in close association with the endoplasmic reticulum. A number of proteins synthesized by ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum are modified in the cisternae of the Golgi apparatus before they are released from its trans phase. So like I explained to you earlier, the proteins which are made by the ribosomes are not the final proteins or the final enzymes that the cells can use. It requires processing. So to do that processing from the endoplasmic reticulum, whatever proteins were made by the ribosomes get transported to the cis phase via a transport vesicle. It moves through all the cisternae towards the trans phase and from there it will leave as a vesicle containing the final product which the cell can use. Golgi apparatus is the important site for the formation of glycoproteins and glycolipids. So I hope that Golgi bodies is now absolutely clear to everybody. Clear? Okay. Now, please come back to this diagram and have a look at this vesicle here. Now, sometimes this vesicle will contain hydrolases. Now, what are hydrolases? As you can see here, hydrolases are going to be those enzymes which are a group like lipases, proteases and carbohydrases. Lipases, proteases and carbohydrases. So what are these hydrolase enzymes? Hydro meaning water, lase or lysis mean to break down. So in the presence of water, these enzymes, these enzymes which you can see here, lipases, proteases, carbohydrases, they can break down those respective compounds like lipids, proteins and carbohydrates. So if you have lipids and if you have some water, then you will have lipase which can break those lipids down into their smaller components catabolize the lipids. Similarly, proteases are enzymes which can break down proteins. Carbohydrases are enzymes which can break down carbohydrates. All of them are called hydrolases because they will require some amount of water for their catalytic activity, enzymatic action. 
So, since these enzymes hydrolases are also called lytic enzymes. Now, why lytic? Because they can break things down. So, now I am telling you that this vesicle contains these lytic enzymes like lipases, proteases and carbohydrases. We can call this tiny vesicle here as lysosome. Why are we calling it as lysosome? What is the meaning of the word lysis? Breakdown. And what is the meaning of the word soma? Body. So, what will be lysosomes? They are bodies which can break things down. They are bodies which can break things down. Lysosoma, lysosomes. So, are we clear as to why they are called lysosomes? So, from this picture, it should be clear that lysosomes are also membrane bound. And what is the main feature of lysosomes? They contain enzymes which can break carbohydrate, proteins and fats. They contain lytic enzymes, hydrolases which can break down a lot of organic compounds. So, moving on, once again, we have an example of this black and white animal cell where I have highlighted the cell organelle that we are considering right now, which are the lysosome. So, now you will see a diagram explaining the functioning of the lysosome. So, here what you see in purple is the lysosome. What you see here in purple is the lysosome and within it we have the digestive enzymes. Which are the digestive enzymes? They are the lytic enzymes, the enzymes which can break things down in the presence of water. So, they are also called as hydrolases and there are three main categories which NCRT has mentioned. You have lipases, proteases and carbohydrases. So, lysosomes have been found to be very rich in all types of hydrolytic enzymes, hydrolases like lipases, proteases and carbohydrases, all these enzymes work optimally or properly if the environment is acidic. So, lysosomes are acidic compartments or they are membrane bound organelles which are acidic on the inside. So, enzymes are optimally active at the acidic pH. Also, these enzymes like I told you before are capable of digesting or breaking down carbohydrates, proteins, lipids and nucleic acids. So now look here in the diagram and you will see that this is the plasma membrane, this is the cytoplasm and this is the lysosome. The plasma membrane is engulfing some food particle as you can see here. Now this food particle could also be a bacteria, it could be random solid food particles. So here you have food material engulfed via the process which I just explained to you called as endocytosis. Particles moving into the cell. Achha, quickly tell me if we are taking things into the cell, endocytosis, it will either be solid or liquid. If it is solid, it will be called phagocytosis. If it is liquid, it will be called as pinocytosis. So can you tell me dear students, what is this process going to be called phagocytosis or pinocytosis? Phagocytosis. So, once the phagocytosis has been done, we get this structure here, this structure here and this structure now is rightly called as a phagosome, phagokhalia, soma, body. Kha lene ke baad, andar jo body bana will be called as phagosome. So, here you have a lysosome with enzymes that can break carbohydrate, proteins and fats and here you have phagosome what the cell has just eaten by phagocytosis. Now, the lysosome combines with the phagosome. Can you see that? So, all the enzymes which are here are being thrust upon the food particles. So, what do you think is going to happen now? All the food particles are going to get broken down. The carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, the nucleic acids if any are here. All of them will be broken down into this structure here. So, this structure which you have here is called as the phagolysosome because it's a combination of the phagosome and the lysosome. So, it will be called as the phagolysosome and the phagolysosome then forms the vesicle with the digested material. Now, most of this material will be used by the cell and if something is completely waste, it will be thrown out via exocytosis. So, the food material was taken in or engulfed via endocytosis or phagocytosis and here here the vesicle with the digested matter which can now also be called as the residual vesicle. This if it contains any waste product will be thrown out via exocytosis. So, this dear students is the main reason why you have lysosomes. 
they are the digestive organelles of a cell they help the cell break down complex material into smaller materials they are the main place within the cell where catabolic activities will take place with the help of enzymes hydrolytic enzymes which work most optimally at the acidic ph also here you can see something else so here is a lysosome with its digestive enzyme and here you have a vesicle which contains these organelles now these are old and dead organelles which the cell no longer needs they are unnecessarily using up a lot of resources of the cell and are unable to work efficiently so what the cell is now thinking is that i would rather have these killed so that when i kill these organelles i can reuse the material somewhere else where it will be more useful so to do this what does the cell do the cell will instruct the lysosome to combine with this vesicle so that the digestive enzyme the proteases the lipases and the carbohydrates can combine with these vesicles and completely break them down once these organelles are broken down this material can be used at other places in the cell to make better things this dear students is called autophagy the word auto means self and the word phagos means to eat here using lysosomes here using lysosomes the cell is actually eating eating its own organelles so it is called as autophagy autophagy so old and damaged organelles get eaten up by the lysosome itself to form the vesicle with the digested matter so cells can also degrade and recycle the components of their own organelles and structures when they are old or damaged or if the cell is starving in the absence of nutrients so it can also happen that the cell does not have enough nutrients it is starving and it has 2 300 mitochondria it doesn't need so many mitochondria because there isn't enough fuel for all these mitochondria so rather than keeping all these mitochondria kill a few of them get raw materials from them which the cell can use for its own energy so that is what this line here is stating that either damaged organelles can be reused by the cell or if the cell is in starvation mode it will kill a few of its organelles to provide energy for itself as i said this process is called as autophagy and this vesicle with the digested matter can be called as the autophagic vesicle autophagic vesicle lastly i also want you to know that sometimes injured cells can cause their own destruction by their lysosomal enzymes so sometimes the cell is so stressed out that it is worrying that if i continue to live i may be a huge damage even to the surrounding cells so in this case the cell may want to commit suicide so the cell might use the lysosomal enzymes to kill itself this dear students is called autolysis is called autolysis so when the cell eats a few of its own organelles which are damaged or which the cell is eating because the cell is in starvation mode is called autophagy autophagy but when a cell kills itself using its own lysosomal enzymes it is going to be called as autolysis autophagy autolysis are these two things clear eating one's own organelles autophagy literally eating up the whole cell and killing the cell with the lysosomal enzymes autolysis so this is one of the reasons why lysosomes can also be called as suicide bags or vesicles because they can literally kill the cell so this dear students finishes everything that we need to know about lysosomes let's have a quick recap from ncert about what exactly are lysosomes so ncert says that lysosomes are membrane bound vesicular structures formed by the process of packaging in the golgi apparatus which i just explained to you the isolated lysosomal vesicles have been found to be very rich in almost all types of hydrolytic enzymes hydrolases like lipases proteases and carbohydrates also enzymes are optimally active at the acidic ph and these enzymes are capable of digesting and breaking down 
carbohydrates, proteins, lipids and nucleic acids. So I hope that lysosomes is now clear to everybody. So we have finished endoplasmic reticulum, we have finished Golgi body and we have finished lysosomes. The next thing that we have to speak about are vacuoles. Now vacuoles are nothing but membrane bound spaces which are found within the cytoplasm. So tiny vesicles which are bound by a membrane within the cytoplasm storing something can broadly be called as vacuoles. The difference between a vacuole and a vesicle is usually vacuoles have water and waste material. So most of the time vacuoles in the case of majority of the organisms will contain water and waste material. So contains water, excretory products and other materials not useful to the cell and they only have a single membrane which is called as tonoplast. So that membrane of the vacuole is called as the tonoplast. So here I want to again bring this to everybody's notice that nucleolus have no membrane, nucleus has two membranes, mitochondria has two membranes, plastids or chloroplast have two membranes, endoplasmic reticulum have one membrane, ribosomes have no membranes, Golgi apparatus has one membrane, lysosomes have one membrane and even this what we are studying right now, vacuoles have one membrane and that membrane is called tonoplast. Vacuoles are broadly classified into three main types. They are central vacuoles or contractile vacuoles or food vacuoles. So the first one is the central vacuole which is found in the case of a plant cell. So plant cells, the vacuoles can occupy up to 90% the volume of the cell. So vacuoles in the case of a plant cell are extremely big, they are right in the center they can occupy 90% of the space within the cell and they will push everything, the entire cytoplasm towards the periphery. So in an animal cell, vacuoles are absent or are extremely tiny vesicles because of which the nucleus in an animal cell remains in the center. But in the case of a plant cell, the vacuole is so huge that it will literally push the nucleus away from the center. So. In plant cells, the vacuoles can occupy up to 90% of the volume of the cell. The tonoplast facilitates the transport of a number of ions and other materials into the vacuole. So the main thing is that from the cytoplasm, remove the water, remove ions and all of that gets stored into the tonoplast, the membrane called tonoplast within the vacuole. That, dear students, is the reason why the concentration of the material within the vacuole is much more than what is outside in the cytoplasm. So this is the illustration to explain what a vacuole looks like in the case of a plant cell. So you can see again our black and white plant cell with the central vacuole which has been highlighted and here I am straight away showing to you how it looks in the electron microscope. So this huge thing here is going to be your vacuole. This which has been pushed on to one side is the nucleus which is crushed. All this which you see here is the cytoplasm and these two things or these three things which you see here are the chloroplasts, the chloroplasts. So whatever is here will have a much higher concentration because the tonoplast, this membrane of the vacuole, central vacuole is allowing it to be on one side, more on one side and less on the other side. And here you can also see that this is occupying a huge space in the volume of the plant cell. So this dear students, what is it called? The central vacuole. What is the membrane of the central vacuole called? Tonoplast. This brings us to the next category of vacuole, which is the food vacuole. Now the food vacuole is seen in many cells like protists. And as the name suggests, it basically is a compartment inside the cytoplasm where the cell will store food. So I have a little video to show you. This what you see here is a paramotion. Many of you have heard about it. It has this little opening here, little opening here, which is like its little mouth from where it is absorbing food from the surrounding. So whatever food is going here, into its little mouth, you can see 
it is forming a compartment here and this compartment here is the food vacuole in fact this hungry little paramosium has been eating a lot so what you can see here is nothing but all its food vacuoles have a look at this again so you can see that it is literally filling up with food can you see it's literally filling up with food so this will be called as the food vacuole finally we have the last category of vacuole which is the contractile vacuole so what is the contractile vacuole as the name suggests it is going to do something called as contract now this is usually found in amoeba it is also found in paramosium so in amoeba the contractile vacuole is important for osmoregulation water balance osmoregulation basically at your level means water balance so the salt and water balance and to throw out any kind of waste products so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you another video and in this video it's a close up of this paramosium can you see that so this is all the material which is extracellular outside the paramosium and this is the material inside the paramosium this is the contractile vacuole in the paramosium so the paramosium is actually going to squeeze this contract it and whatever water or waste is present will be pushed out now the beauty of this what you will see is that once this gets squeezed you will see it in the video give it a minute the beauty is that the minute this gets squished there are these other tiny little vesicles which you will see come up here like the rays of a sun like the rays of a sun which will put more water into this more kachra into this so i'm going to play this video now also remember that this video has been played at a very high frame rate meaning i have sped up the video it does not happen so quickly in nature in nature this process which you will see here is much slower than what you see i have just sped up the video so that you can see clearly what is happening so it's filling up filling up filling up and pushed out pushed out can you see that now see did you notice how these little tubes little tubes filled the central one again so that more water and kachra can be pushed out so i'm just going to let this video play so that you understand how a contractile vacuole works correct so this are a few pictures showing the same thing so this here is the contractile vacuole when it is full and it is about to contract and push all the material which is within it outside and once it is going to contract itself contract itself this is how it will appear this is how it will appear so that dear students finishes off everything related to vacuoles vacuoles are nothing but membrane bound spaces found in the cytoplasm that membrane is going to be called as the tonoplast usually contains material which is not useful to the cell usually excretory waste or water it is going to be of three main types which you can see here the three types are going to be the central vacuole in a plant the contractile vacuole in an amoeba and in certain protista you are also going to have the food vacuoles like in paramosium all the information here is from ncrt which i have tabulated for your ease of understanding is this clear okay so that brings us to the last thing we need to discuss today which is what is the endomembrane system now if you are paying attention it should be very clear that endo means inside endomembrane system the system within the cell made up of a single membrane which is carrying out similar coordinated functions can be called as the endomembrane system so while each of the membranous organelles is distinct in terms of its structure and function many of these are considered together as a endomembrane system so which are the organelles that you have studied you have studied plastids you have studied mitochondria you have studied ribosomes endoplasmic reticulum today we studied golgi bodies lysosomes vacuoles so all these 
are going to be the membrane bound organelles which are found inside the cell. Of course, ribosomes are not membrane bound, but the remaining ones are. So out of all of these, there are a few which have similar coordinated functions. Can you tell me which ones are they which have similar functions? Endoplasmic reticulum, which is connected to Golgi bodies, which is connected to vesicles which are coming outside, which are going to be the lysosomes and even vacuoles, which are going to be single membrane vesicles. So these four together are called as the endomembrane system. Mitochondria and chloroplast are not included in this because they have very very distinct functions other than this and ribosomes cannot be considered only simply for the reason that they do not have a membrane. So the endomembrane system includes endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, lysosomes and vacuoles. Four things. Since the function of mitochondria, chloroplast, peroxisomes are not coordinated with the above components, these are not considered as a part of the endomembrane system. So, dear students, we have already completed plastids, mitochondria, ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum as organelles till the last lecture. Today, we have finished off Golgi apparatus, lysosomes and vacuoles. Next time, we will be continuing with the cytoskeleton. This, dear students, concludes our lecture today. I hope you have understood everything that we have done today. And I cannot wait to see your smiling faces in the next lecture. Thank you. God bless. Work hard. Be nice.